Main Street Wyoming is made possible by Kennecott Energy Company. Proud to be part of Wyoming's future in the coal and uranium industries, which includes exploration, mining, and production. And the Wyoming Council for the Humanities, enriching lives of Wyoming people through the study of Wyoming history, values, and ideas. In 1913, a Wyoming ranch family welcomed the addition of a second son. Like other boys of his time, he grew up riding horseback across the Wyoming hills, picking up arrowheads, memorizing the gulches, the bluffs, the mountains, which were his world. He collected special stones, but what young boy doesn't? Who could have predicted that this boy would one day be called the grand old man of Rocky Mountain geology? Join us on Main Street, Wyoming for the story of Dr. David Love. Beautiful bird. The rainy season mist, yellow blossoms never touched by yellow. Dr. Love, you and your brother were very close in age. Your sister was born much later, but you were the only children in a thousand square miles. Can you tell me what that was like when you were growing up? You have to imagine a, uh, that your world was populated by cowboys and no children, no women. The uh, no radio, no television, uh, no music. You had to develop other resources. Our house was lined with books. Our uh, Bible was the nation was the uh, 1911 Encyclopedia Britannica, but we had a thousand other books, several thousand, in fact, and. Uh, um, mother had been a Latin and Greek scholar, and we had uh, many books in Latin and Greek, which of course we couldn't read. Others in French, others in German. Uh, mother tried to teach us uh, some French and some German, but she despaired of Latin and Greek. Your mother was your, your primary teacher when you were growing up. What subjects did she teach? She taught uh, all subjects. We had no schoolhouse. We had the school in the living room of the ranch house, and it was uh, unheated. The fireplace did not work, and there was no stove there, no central heating. So um, um, we had to be bundled up uh, pretty much in the wintertime, but uh, it was off from the uh, dining room, which was always the, in the kitchen, which were the most uh, populous places in the in the this huge ranch house. So we were alone enough so that uh, we could concentrate and get things done. Where you lived, there weren't any trees. I mean, there were just rocks. Can can you describe for me your first interest in geology? Uh, my first memories go way back. And mother had uh, Leconte's Field Geology, which was a book about that thing. It was written in the 1870s. And it uh, opened windows to a whole other world for us. And uh, both of plants and animals and rocks and uh, earth history. And it was fascinating to us. We could see rocks. Uh, some of them are flat, some of them are folded, some are red, some are uh, candy-striped badlands. And when you uh, have very little else to keep your mind occupied, you, if you're writing, for example, for 10, 12 hours behind a bunch of cattle, the scene is not very inspiring, but uh, when you look off at these rocks and you wonder why they're there. If you look at other places where 
There's rich grass, other places where there's no grass, other places where there are bog holes, bo uh, swampy areas in which we as children uh, could dig and, and pull out uh, both modern and prehistoric bison skulls. And, uh, and our Indian artifacts made of certain kinds of rocks, always pretty rocks. And th those were the things that uh, captivated my interest. Your mother wrote of your unusual ability to detect arrowheads. What do you attribute that to? It's not that uh, my vision was any better. It was because I was much closer to the ground and I could see things uh, <laughs> uh, from a different perspective. <laughs> Being the youngest. <laughs> hmm. By the time you were in high school, though, you went into town, into Lander, with your mother. Um, finished high school there, then went to the University of Wyoming, where you obtained both your bachelor's and your uh, master's. But after that, you decided to go back east. You went to Yale to get your Ph.D. Can you remember that? What did you think, this, this young man from Wyoming? When I uh, got my master's degree, it was in the depth of the Depression. I was lucky to get a job at $30 a month. And uh, after a year of uh, working as a, both a, as a consultant when there were jobs available or for the Wyoming Geological Survey, I made $60 a month. And I uh, could see that uh, the future was uh, going to require something else. So I applied for graduate work at Columbia and at Yale. Uh, Columbia put me on standby. Yale said, come ahead. They gave me $350 a year scholarship, and that was a big scholarship. I thought I could make it on that, so I went back there. And uh, they gave me a scholarship each year for three years, and that's how I got through. Going back there was, was in one sense, traumatic. In another sense, these were golden years, the golden years of my life. I learned so much from so many people about so many things that uh, those were and will always in my mind be uh, the golden years. But it was as a graduate student that you were first invited to speak to the Geological Society of America. That was unusual for a graduate student. Uh, I was uh, imbued with absolute terror. <laughs> I wanted out a thousand times. But I went ahead and uh, did it. And uh, I was so unglued, being dressed up in a suit with suspenders, and I forgot to fasten the suspenders. <laughs> <laughs> so I was up there and giving this uh, world famous speech with my suspenders hanging down. <laughs> Well, how did they react? It wasn't. Uh, graduate students do not ordinarily address this group. Uh, no. Uh, so I, I realized I was privileged, and this was special. And uh, uh, rather than uh, it being a, a case of humiliation, it became a case for much laughter <laughs> <laughs> and goodwill. What about the contents of your actual talk? The uh, contents uh, were about uh, the Absarca Range, which we can see from this interview spot. And uh, uh, up until that time, people had knew, knew nothing about the Absarca Range. And uh, theoretically, all the rocks were horizontal. And uh, all the younger rocks were horizontal. And I had found that many of them were not, that some were folded over others, just like a deck of cards being uh, shifted. And uh, 
that I could date them, and uh, that uh, uh, introduced a whole new concept of uh, timing of the last of the Laramide Revolution, which was the big mountain building revolution that uh, uh, affected Western United States. Well, you had many revolutionary insights with regard to geology, but when you finished with your PhD, you went to work for Shell Oil Company. What happened there? Because you didn't stay with them very long. Uh, the, uh, as soon as I got my PhD, I was offered a job as a rodman with the U.S. Geological Survey. <clears throat> it was a temporary job with no perks, no expenses, $150 a month. And I thought I was pretty good and I deserved a lot better than that. But uh, one of my uh, esteemed advisors uh, at Yale said, take it, let's get your foot in the door. So I took it and I went out to Utah and uh, lived in Provo and worked uh, in the Wasatch Mountains. I never worked any harder in my life than that uh, work, but it was only for five months and then it was over. So uh, I was out of a job. And uh, some years before, a uh, geologist with Shell Oil Company said, whenever you want a job, call me. So I called him and he said, uh, take the first train out to Centralia, Illinois which was a boom town. They had just struck oil there. And for five years, I worked for Shell in uh, boom country, Illinois, Michigan, Arkansas, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. And th those were great years because they uh, were good to me. They paid me well. They supported my work. I had no complaints at all, except that uh, the wonderful discoveries I had made and was continuing to make and foreseeing in the future, everything went into a locked file and never came out, and it never has. And I couldn't see a professional life that was frustrated by a locked file case. And that was the reason for leaving Shell, taking a 60% uh, cut in salary and uh, going back to the USGS on a permanent basis. It was uh, during World War II, and uh, uh, we were sending planes and tanks and uh, battleships into combat without any armor plate. The Germans had cut off the source of vanadium for vanadium steel, and we had none. So it was a desperate time, and I was assigned to uh, um, prospect for and find vanadium to set up mines and to um, determine volumes of ore and the grade of ore that could be mined, and to find salt and uh, sulfur that were needed for the processing of vanadium. We had known uh, before the war that there was some uranium in the phosphoria formation where the phosphate beds are in Wyoming and Idaho. And uh, so I was sent out there to uh, first-hand trench the, uh, the exposures of the phosphoria, uh, collect uh, samples to analyze them in the field, and then to uh, locate eight mines. And we located the mines uh, uh, southeast of Afton in the mountains. One of your major accomplishments is the development of the theories of how Jackson Hole and the Tetons were created. Why did you start with that area? Why did you focus on the Tetons? Uh, first of all, it's a beautiful country. I yeah, know they're beautiful. <laughs> but, but what was it about the geology? 
beneath that facade of beauty, uh, it is uh, without uh, doubt, at least in my mind, the most uh, complete geologic record from the beginning of Earth history up to the present time. Well, that's saying a lot. When you look at the Grand Canyon, you think there's a lot of history there, but that's only part of it. Uh, in the uh, Teton Jackson Hole country, uh, there has been constant uh, uh, crustal activity of the earth, especially in uh, the last uh, 100 million years. Uh, the uh, seas had withdrawn and mountains were pushed up and then uh, they were uh, buried with debris and then uh, the debris on both sides went down and was preserved and the mountains went up further and volcanism uh, occurred in Yellowstone and uh, uh, went on for uh, perhaps uh, uh, 60 million years and is almost going on now. So uh, we're, it's an area of great crustal unrest and uh, with each spasm of unrest uh, there is a record preserved in some of the rocks in the area. I remember as a young girl growing up in Wyoming, there was a phenomenon um, of people running around with Geiger counters. Apparently you had something to do with that. I was uh, uh, asked to uh, step in whenever there was a crisis of some kind and they needed something. This time it happened to be uranium uh, this was uh, uh, my involvement uh, began during the war because there was uranium in the vanadium in the phosphoria formation. And uh, so we knew about it. And uh, when the uranium uh, boom started, it was all down in Colorado and uh, Utah. And, uh, and later it spread to New Mexico and uh, to Wyoming, but uh, in Wyoming, uh, we knew there was some uranium because the uh, uh, cook in a sheep camp in the Red Desert country had found this uh, strange yellow mineral, and she had sent it uh, into a uh, mineralogist in uh, Oregon, and he named it dacite. And uh, so we we knew that there had been some uranium, and the Silver Cliff mine at Lusk had been a, a silver mine uh, many, many years ago and was now abandoned. So we knew a little bit uh, there was uranium, but the, the people who were handling the money and the projects said that the uranium had to be related to uh, volcanic rocks. and. Uh, so the concentration of investigation and money was in Colorado and Utah. Well, I, uh, I couldn't see it that way because uh, we had found bones in the Powder River Basin that uh, were radioactive. So uh, I prevailed on the, the uh, survey to uh, let me use a DC-3 old bomber to uh, with a magnetometer bomb out in the on a hundred yards of cable and a uh, scintillator which recorded radioactivity to uh, fly several traverses across the uh, powder river basin and we got uh, uh, several big kicks on the uh, scintillator and went out in the field in October and we found a single, uh, what we call a uranium roll. It's a round uh, tube-like uh, deposit of uranium and it uh, ran 15% uranium, which was uh, extraordinary. And uh, uh, it was so, of such national importance that uh, in two weeks I had written a report and had it uh, printed on this. 
in the Atomic Energy Commission and the people who, uh, in the survey, who had different ideas, um, got a, a committee together to go out and, and see how much I was lying. Well, we found about eight more deposits there, and, and they became, in years to come, uh, uranium mines. So uh, uh, that was uh, uh, one part of the story. As soon as the word got out and the uranium boom there started and people were uh, harassing the ranchers and uh, uh, staking claims everywhere regardless of the ownership, they, uh, one company offered me a million dollars to uh, head it up and uh, to leave the survey. At that time, I was making about $8,000 a year and had four little children. And uh, so there was a temptation to, uh, to uh, make the big bucks. But... Uh, but you I, didn't. Why? Why did you, how did, how did you make that choice? A million dollars in what, what, 1950 or early, late 40s, what? 1954. You turned down a million dollars to yeah. continue your work, which you loved. And a Scotchman <laughs> doing that. <laughs> no, it was a temptation, yes. But uh, uh, other things were more important. How big was this going to be? Were there other places? What uh, challenges were left in uranium and other associated minerals or the principles of ore finding? All those things were involved in the decision to uh, go where the adventure was and not where the big bucks were. As a scientist, I know that throughout your life, one of the dilemmas you've faced is that sometimes you discover things that, that lead to repercussions that you weren't expecting. One of the big areas was in the Gas Hills, really not very far from where your ranch was. When you go out and you look at that landscape, what, what, do you, what are your feelings about that? I wonder if I was right in uh, finding uranium. and. Uh, yeah, going on with the research necessary to determine why it is where it is in the world. Is that uh, a public service or is it a, something that will be misused by countries and by people to uh, um, create uh, kingdoms? that uh, will enslave other parts of the world. I'd, I'm, uh, I'm not sure what I did was a public service or a detriment. Well, you even discovered oil in Yellowstone, and you made the choice yeah. to let that be known. Yes, I wrote a paper on uh, oil in Yellowstone. We were not allowed to use that title. Uh, we had to call it hydrocarbons in thermal areas. <laughs> so no one would notice <laughs> that this had been discovered. But uh, it has been, uh, that study has been expanded and it's very useful in, in uh, determining uh, how oil can occur in volcanic rocks. And uh, can it be used to... Uh, uh, can these floods of oil that come out uh, in the, on the walls of Yellowstone Canyon be used as uh, indicators of past and perhaps future uh, uh, seismic activity? Does the oil get squeezed out of the canyon walls by earthquakes? Things like that. So there are other uses for the information than saying we get so many barrels of oil out of this kind of rock. When you think about your unique upbringing, your classical education, growing up in a place in which you were surrounded with geology and had plenty of time to think, do you think there could be a David Love today? That's an interesting philosophical question. I think uh, human beings can be adapted 
to anything. They don't have to be parallel to uh, my bringing up. Uh, some of the uh, geologists I have known have uh, come from big cities. Some of them were born with spoons in their mouths and uh, never had to worry about uh, money and have become uh, great people. I could name a few that I've worked with who were like that. And uh, uh, one of them in particular, his middle name was Carnegie. And uh, he's used his money wisely and used it for, for uh, the benefit of both uh, economics and uh, mankind. So uh, I think anything is possible regardless of your background. Thank you, Dr. Love, for sharing your home and your time with us. Well, this has been a pleasure. It uh, will be interesting to see what the spinoff is. <laughs> For a copy of this or any Main Street, Wyoming, send a check or money order to Wyoming Public Television or call us at 1-800-495-9788. Please include the subject or broadcast date of the program. The cost of each VHS tape is $20. We accept Visa, MasterCard, and Discover. Main Street, Wyoming is made possible by Kennecott Energy Company. Proud to be part of Wyoming's future in the coal and uranium industries, which includes exploration, mining, and production. The Wyoming Council for the Humanities, enriching lives of Wyoming people through the study of Wyoming history, values, and ideas. And by Amoco and its employees, who have contributed to Wyoming's history and continue to be active in Wyoming communities and in the state. Amoco, you expect more from a leader.